Um, so I am uh, Michael Bloom. I'm a tax partner here at Venable. And I got with me is Chris Davidson. Uh, he's also a tax partner at Venable. And we uh, put together this presentation on qualified small business stock for, for everyone here today because we were seeing a lot of questions in this area. Uh, and with clients and CPAs that had a varying degrees of knowledge about the topic, some clients who had, you know, we would have thought would have heard of it before, but had no knowledge whatsoever. And then some CPAs and um, other clients that were asking very sophisticated questions. And But we definitely noticed an uptick of, of interest in this area. And uh, so we decided to put this together for everyone to, to hopefully answer some of those questions and give everybody some maybe planning ideas and things to be aware of that they weren't already aware of uh, with respect to QSBS. Yeah, and, and guys, during this, um, we if you guys have questions, uh, feel free to send them in. We will be getting those. We will either try to answer those uh, during the course of the, of the of the program, or if if we can't get to it just because of timing constraints and whatnot, um, we certainly can follow up uh, afterwards. So happy to have questions, and I know we got a few questions ahead of time, so we'll try to address those as we kind of go go throughout. Yeah. Yeah, and so thank thank you for those folks that submitted uh, questions in advance. They're great questions, uh, including someone from the University of Rochester. I am from Rochester, so we will make sure to get to that question. Uh, so here is a, a brief overview of what we're hoping to cover today. Uh, it's going to start out with the nuts and bolts. Uh, what what's the QSBS tax benefit, and what are the requirements to qualify? That's you know, to get into the more interesting topics and the pitfalls, you have to understand. Okay, what what are the what are the nuts and bolts? What are the basic rules? And then you can have some fun, do some planning, and and cover some of the more interesting things after you know the basic rules. Uh, then we'll shift over to pitfalls, mistakes that we see uh, being made out there with respect to QSBS. There are uh, various ways that you can have stock that qualifies and then do something that you think is totally innocuous, which has the effect of disqualifying this uh, stock status as QSBS. Um, things that you wouldn't think would do that, but but we see those quote unquote mistakes being made. So we wanted to spread the words to folks that do planning in this area or own QSBS to be aware of these things. Um, next, we'll talk about choice of entity and qualified small business stock. One of the you know first questions that you you know have to answer if you're a founder of a startup is okay I have this great idea I want to start a company uh, and so I'm gonna form a legal entity for my company and it boils down to effectively two choices uh, there are S corps out there but but those are disfavored for reasons that aren't. Uh, particularly relevant to this topic. So you're going to decide between a C-Corp and an LLC. And there are various factors, pros and cons, um, that you should be going through in making that determination. But one of the key factors in that analysis is QSBS eligibility. And uh, so we'll talk about how that plays into your choice of entity analysis. Um, and then not not infrequently, someone will have started the company, you know, as an LLC and, you know, not really thinking about or knowing about QSBS and uh, will then hear about the benefit and say, oh, is it too late? You know, can I do some restructuring now to, to shoehorn my company and my uh, equity ownership into this this regime to get the benefits, and we'll talk about the ways you can do that. Um, you know, so generally the answer is yes, but there are things you have to be aware of when you do that. Some things that are favorable, some things that are not so favorable. Uh, so it gets a little nuanced if you're starting from one structure and converting to the other, and then the planning in this area, uh, ways to take the the. QSBS 10 million, the $10 million exemption that most people know about and uh, effectively juice it up. Um, a different planning, which is goes by the terminology of stacking and packing. Uh, so that's what we're hoping to cover today. Uh, and so I guess we'll jump right into it. Chris, do you want? 
Want to say anything before I move Maybe along? Yeah. Good to go. Okay. Okay. So the basic, the basic rule, or the basic benefit. You know why? Why should I care if my stock is QSBS? You know, it's you know if I hold it, for, if I have stock, I hold it for a year. Isn't it long term capital gain? Why is this any different? Well, it's it's different because the headline here. Let me just get to my section. It's a little easier to read. So the the headline and the main benefit is that if you own QSBS stock that qualifies as QSBS, and we'll get into that, and you hold it for five years, and you sell it you can exclude from your gross income the greater of $10 million or 10 times your adjusted basis in the disposed of stock. That's per taxpayer. Each taxpayer that has uh, qualifying stock that's held for five years gets this benefit. And as you'll see, it's not particularly hard to qualify um, uh, for as qualified small business stock. There's no election that needs to be made. If the if your investment or um, ownership stake uh, meets these requirements, it is treated as QSBS. You don't have to do anything. So there are a lot of people that may own QSBS already that don't even realize it, that don't know enough to, to ask the question. And in fact, sometimes the first time they get asked the question is after they've sold and their accountant says, hey, what's this QSBS? And they look at them and say, well, what's that? And so we're trying to prevent that fact pattern. So here's an example that can translate into a pretty big savings. Uh, so take this simple example. Uh, Kim creates a startup. It's a dating app in 2017. She sells the company for $100 million five years later. So she's meeting the five-year holding period requirement. Their founder shares. She didn't pay anything for them. So she has zero basis in her shares as a founder. And assume that her, her company, based on what it does, is, is eligible for 1202 benefits. And you know, her share on exit is say it's worth $30 million. So she's gonna pick up $30 million of long-term capital gain. But because of qualifying for this benefit, she can shave off $10 million of that gain and only has to report. Uh, Twenty million dollars of gain. So what? What's the benefit of that? Well, if the if the long term capital gain rate is twenty, and then you have a three point eight net investment income tax on top of that under fourteen eleven, you're saving at the federal level a uh, twenty three point eight percent on that ten million dollars of excluded gain. So two point three eight million dollars. That's pretty good, and uh, that also doesn't even consider the state tax benefit. Some states piggyback and I'll say follow 1202, meaning that if it is excluded at the federal level, it is also excluded on your state income tax return. California does not follow the 1202. It quote unquote decouples, but New York does. So if you're a New York resident and now the state income tax on over a million dollars is over 9% and you're in the city and you have a 3.8% New York City tax, you also get to exclude the state tax on that excluded gain as well. So this is a, a significant, significant tax savings um, for investments that qualify. Well, sort of, that's, that's the headline. I can exclude $10 million of gain. But digging in a little bit more as to how the rule works, if you pulled up the code section and looked at 1202, it it wouldn't say I can exclude a hundred I can exclude ten million dollars of gain or ten times basis. What what 1202A says is that taxpayers are permitted to exclude fifty percent, called an exclusion percentage, of their gain on the sale of qualified small business stock. Well. That exclusion percentage has been increased over time. If you look down below, it, it started at 50%. So if you pull up the code, you're going to see the 50% rule. But if you continue to read down, you're going to see additional legislation that was passed that increased that exclusion from 50 and then to 75 to 100. So now we're at 100% exclusion um, for your eligible gain. The limit, the $10 million limit comes in under 1202B, which basically says for any taxpayer with respect to a, a single corporation, you can exclude the greater of, uh, in, in a single tax year, the greater of $10 million or 10X 
the taxpayer's adjusted basis in the disposed of stock. Um, the, the 10 million is, a, is an aggregate number, so you can't spread that out over time and get more than that. Uh, but we'll talk about additional ways to, to do that stacking and packing. So that's digging down how, how it works. That's, um, and if you keep reading in the code, you'll see that there's a special rate for section 1202 gain at um, that's taxed at the rate of 28%. Well, in that example that we started with, you didn't hear anything about a 28% rate. What, what this rule means, and it's sort of a vestige of, of prior, uh, you know, prior uh, code versions, is that, that if your exclusion percentage is not 100, say it's some lesser amount like the 50 or the 75, that that delta, that percentage that must be included in your ta taxable income is taxed at a rate of 28%. This is not really relevant if you have the 100%, if your investment qualifies for the 100% exclusion, uh, because it's all being excluded. There's nothing that's being included. Uh, but if you'll notice that Biden's tax plan was proposing to curtail this benefit for high income taxpayers. And what it was saying is if your AGI is over four hundred thousand dollars. Well, it's going to revert. The rule is going to revert back to the fifty percent exclusion percentage. So what that means is that if this passes, and the likelihood is is small at this point in time, that Biden's tax plan is going to become law. But let's just say it does. Well, what would happen if your AGI is over four hundred k? Well, you could exclude on that Kim example where she sells the dating app company. She has thirty million dollars of gain. Let's take a look. You, your per issuer limitation is the same. It's still the greater of $10 million or 10x basis that she has zero basis in her shares. That's $10 million. So at a 50% rate, she can exclude five, but she has to pick up five at the 28% rate. So that's a blended 14% rate on the $10 million. Uh, and then the balance of $20 million is just normal long-term capital gain, the normal rates apply to that. So there's still there still would be some benefit to qualifying for QSBS under the Biden tax plan. Uh, it just would not be as great as it currently is. And you see that basically the next few slides show that example. If QSBS on these facts, QSBS doesn't apply, federal tax 7.14 million, uh, 50%, 6.35 million, and 100%, 4.76 million. So it's it's being phased down. It's it's not being completely eliminated. That's yeah. the takeaway. Yeah, I, I think an important thing to to note, and this is one of the reasons why the the QSBS stock has really been something that's kind of come to the forefront uh, recently is, is you kind of have, have two things, one in 2010, when they increased the rate to a hundred percent for your exclusion percentage, um, that obviously made things on an exit very attractive because you weren't, you know, basically when you look at a blended rate, you weren't saving that much if you had to pay, you know, tax at 28% on half of it. Um, so moving it to a hundred percent really moved things. And then with the tax cuts and jobs act with the C corp rate moving to 21% from 35%, kind of the combination of the two things, um, it kind of made this a very attractive, uh, you know, very attractive, uh, tax benefit, uh, to be utilized. So there's really been a big uptick in this recently. So, um, it is something to monitor if, you know, obviously, you know, kind of with any choice of entity or, or you know, or, or tax benefit like this, um, it is important to kind of monitor and see where things are going, because obviously if these percentages change or tax rates change, uh, you know, on C corporations or something like that, obviously the, the benefits, uh, you know, will, you know, can greatly differ. So... The this is just a, a, a um, excerpt of the Biden legislation, and you're seeing what it's proposing to do, which is effectively turn off for the eight taxpayers with AGI above 400k to turn off those higher percentages and revert back to what is shown in green above, which is the 50% rate. And note also that that the 50% rate would apply from dollar zero for dollar one to uh, 
uh, trusts and estates. So you couldn't create a whole bunch of trusts, put 400 K worth of QSBS stock in each trust and get the, and get the hundred percent, you know, benefit if you have those as the sellers on your exit. So uh, each trust from dollar one is, is treated as a high income taxpayer. So that's the, that's the tax benefit. That's an overview of the tax benefit. Let's so I'm going to turn it over to Chris now to talk about and give an overview of, okay, well, how do I know if my stock is QSBS stock? Yeah, so the 1202, which is a code section that has all these rules, has it has a has a bunch of requirements, um, you know, to qualify as QSBS. For purposes of this, we'll we'll kind of go through kind of the main ones. A lot of the other ones are kind of ticking boxes to make sure um, nothing strange is is going around. And and you know, most most of the time when you go do go to look at this, your accountant or your tax attorney or whoever probably has a checklist that they kind of run through uh, just to make sure um, uh, everything's kind of. Uh, uh, you know, hit on, but we'll, we'll, we'll talk about kind of, we'll, we'll, I'll kind of consider the four, the four main ones, um, kind of really for starting out. So, um, the, the first requirement is that the, the stock that you have needs to be C Corp, uh, C Corp stock, uh, the 1202, the exclusion doesn't apply to S corporations. It doesn't, you know, S corp stock doesn't apply to, uh, interest in LLCs or LPs or other partnerships, in, unless they've made an election to be treated, um, you know, as as a corporation for income tax purposes and or, or RC corporation. So that's one of the uh, one of the requirements is that that's what that's what you need to sell. Um, as we'll talk about uh, a little bit later, it it doesn't necessarily mean that you need to start as a C corp. Um, there can be an ability to start as an LLC or an LP, uh, and ultimately convert or contribute, uh, into a, a C corp structure, um, where you can, where you can get benefits moving forward from that. Um, it, it will affect your holding period as we'll discuss, but you can do that. Similarly, you can do it, uh, with S corporations where you could have the S corp contribute into another C corp. Uh, and kind of hold that stock moving forward, and we'll 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 talk about that a little bit. But that's um, kind of one of the main main requirements. There is, is you're going to have to have a sale of C corp stock. Um, the next requirement is that you're going to have to have received the stock on original issue uh, from the C corporation. Um, so this it, this is going to be the way the statute puts it is that you need to receive your stock in exchange for cash or property other than stock uh, and or for uh, as compensation for services. Um, so that's that's the original issue requirement you cannot do, which you, you know, you'll see sometimes people want to do a cross purchase uh, or something of that nature. Uh, if you do purchase your shares from another shareholder. They will not be eligible because uh, they will not meet this original issuance uh, requirement. Additionally, which we'll talk about in a little bit, there's also some rules that have to deal with redemptions such that you can't uh, get around this original issuance requirement by uh, effectively contributing money to the corporation and having another shareholder uh, redeemed out of the corporation shortly thereafter. Uh, effectively, kind of doing a, a you know a disguise sale of, of the shares. Um, there's some rules in place for that. Again, the 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 1202 and the benefits that it's provided are really really set up for people who are making investments into these uh, you know quote unquote small businesses, um, and and so they really want the investment in there, not not something where you're moving money outside across the top. Um, the, the third requirement here that's kind of a big one that I'm sure most of you've heard of here uh, is there's effectively an asset limitation on uh, the ability to qualify as, as a qualified small business. Um, effectively, the requirement is that it, at any point after the, um, the enactment of this uh, of 1202, which was in 1993, uh, the corporation um, needs to have assets that are uh, not in excess of $50 million. 
Uh, and this includes when you have a, a fund, uh, you know, raising when you have a series A or B or whatever, and, and you take on additional capital, this is looking at both a pre-money and a post-money uh, situation. So to counting the cash that's coming in uh, to the company uh, in, in those offerings. Um, now, it, it's, it's a little bit different than just a straight $50 million limit because the way that the rule works is it measures based on the amount of cash and the aggregate adjusted basis of the assets that you have in the company, uh, as opposed to their fair market value. Um, that that's kind of the generic, the general rule. Um, you know, so you can have companies that are actually valued way in excess, um, way in excess of fifty million dollars. Um, but that, uh, but that's still qualify for this because a lot of that value is into self-created goodwill or something like that. Um, another, another point to make here is this, this can also be important when you are having rounds or, you know, you're ra you are raising money. Um, if you are close to that 50 million threshold, um, or you're going to do a, a very large, uh, you know, round of fundraising, um, you know, some thought may be given to sometimes making sure that you're breaking up kind of your raising at the, at the, the right level so that you can stay under, under those thresholds. Um, again, because if you take in, if I have a company that's, you know, let's say that I have $20 million worth of cash and, and adjusted basis in my assets, and I go out and I want to raise $40 million. If I raise $40 million on those facts, I'm going to break you know, the $50 million threshold for that particular thing. And no one, no one who gets stock after that point, you know, in that particular offering or thereafter uh, is, is going to be able to qualify for this. If on the other hand, um, I raise, you know, $20 million uh, in, in a round, and then I go out and I'm, you know, obviously going to utilize that money for, you know, business expansion purposes, uh, you know, deductible expenses, um, and if I can then get my asset basis back down under the 50 million, I may be able to raise the 20 million shortly thereafter in another round without going over the $50 million cap. Um, the one other point to, to look at here with the, with the qualified uh, small business or uh, qualification is if you do go, uh, if you do wind up converting from another type of entity or you do contribute property, uh, which is what those conversions would be deemed to be, um, instead of using uh, aggregate adjusted basis of the assets, it actually treats that as the fair market value uh, when contributed. So that can make it a little harder to qualify in those circumstances, but as we'll talk about in a little bit, can help for some of the other, some of the other, other, other rules. Um, the, the, the fourth uh, requirement that we're going to talk a little bit about here, uh, active business requirement. Um, it, it, in order to be a qualified small business, um, it, it, at least 80% of the company's assets must be used in the, the active conduct of a qualified trader business. Um, yeah. I want to make oh. one oh, yeah, point about the stock. So, so if you're a key employee uh, of a, uh, a company that is a corporation, sometimes you get options. You don't get stock. And then the question is, okay, well, am I eligible? I have these options. Uh, can I get this benefit? Well, if it's non-qualified stock options, you have to exercise the option, in which case you're, you know, buying the, paying the strike price and getting the shares. That begins your holding period. And you're picking up gain at that point. You're, you're recognizing income, the difference between the, the value of the shares at that time and your strike price. Um, and then if you hold from five years after that and then sell, uh, yes, you would. And presumably you're, you're, you're checking the box on all the other requirements. It's an eligible business and it, you know, met the gross asset test. But putting that aside for now, yes, you can. So this isn't just for founders and for VC firms or angel investors. If you're a key employee and you're getting, well, certainly if you're getting, you know, stock grants or restricted stock. Uh, that vests, or you make an 83B election so that you're treated as as owning the shares on day one. 
um, not at the time they vest, then then yes, you you can qualify for this benefit. The 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 point here that I would make though is that oftentimes if you're an employee, you don't want you don't come out of pocket and um, when you get this, the non-qualified stock options and exercise your shares on day one, you you don't want to you don't want to pay the cash, so you sit on them, and then valuations go up. And in the future, you, again, don't want to come out of pocket to pay the cash. And then at that point in time, if you were to pay the cash, because the valuation has gone up, the spread between the value of the options and your strike price is greater. So you'd also have an income pickup. So you don't exercise. You don't become the owner of the shares. You don't meet the five-year holding period. Then the company goes to exit that you've worked for for a long time. And you do a cashless exercise. They basically buy your options out. And then the entire amount is ordinary income. So not only are you not getting the QSBS benefit because uh, you didn't you know, exercise early, but now you're paying not a capital gain tax rate, but say a 37% federal rate. A, you're say a New York City person and you got you know, nine plus percent state, 3.8% New York City tax, payroll taxes of 2.9%. You're above 50% on your exit when, you know, if you had done some planning and maybe thought of ways to finance or fund an early exercise of your options, you could have held them and met the, not just the long-term capital gain, you know, requirement of one year, but a QSBS benefit if you, you know, have worked for the company for five years. Um, so that is, uh, you know, that's just something to keep in mind that if you if you are a key employee or you represent key employees, like think about, you know, what would happen if you uh, don't early exercise, um, because it, it might be worth it. I know we see most employees just just don't, but um, they're potentially leaving a lot of value on the table. Um, yeah. OK, so. So getting back to the, the active business requirement, and this is this is something, there are a couple slides here that give give a little overview of this, but just wanted to kind of highlight on this. Not not every business that's out there is going to qualify for, for 1202 uh, purposes. Um, the definition that's 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 in the slides there, uh, basically the the statute carves out uh, what we would think of as kind of service businesses. So the fields of health, law, engineering, architecture, accounting, uh, consulting. Consulting is a big one um, that you'll see with things because it kind of goes potentially with a lot, lot of businesses. Um, the thing I want to, the thing I kind of want to want to point out uh, just with this active business requirement. Um, you know, obviously everyone can kind of kind of see what those what those businesses are. But the it, it's 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 kind of unclear when you when you potentially fall into those those actual disallowed services and and when you don't, um, you know the IRS has not put put out a ton of guidance in the twelve oh two space. It has put out uh, a, a few private letter rulings, which which actually tend to have fairly favorable guidance for taxpayers in these things where you do have businesses that are in a lot of them tangentially or, or related to the to the healthcare industry that ultimately were not considered to be providing services in the field of health um, it, it, you know so there so there there's just because you kind of look like you fall into one of these there there is an ability um, if if your business really is in a service oriented business uh, a lot of times to to qualify the um the thing that I wanted to note is, and what Mike and I has seen in some of our things, and actually we did a we did a tax opinion for one of these fairly recently, um, is kind of terminology get, that gets used for this. And this is why I think it is important to kind of give consideration to this stuff ahead of time. Uh, if you do think you have a business that may be 1202 qualifying, um, one of the things we do notice is people tend to put the word consulting uh, or a, a consultant into a lot of different businesses that have some aspect of that, but really are there to solve a, solving some other kind of problem and providing some other kind of product ultimately that the, the end user receives. Um, you know, so 
if you do have a business that kind of is related to these fields, it is something that's worthwhile to give some thought to, uh, to see how it, how it may fit in. And again, there's not a ton of guidance in the 1202 space. The 199 uh, A regs uh, did come out, 199A kind of piggybacks off of 1202 for, for purposes of qualifying businesses. So if you have a 1202 qualifying businesses, oftentimes it's also a 199A uh, qualifying business. Uh, there, there's a lot of overlap there. So there is some regulations that that may be helpful, although they're not a actually applicable for 1202 purposes, but something that 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 can be can be kind of looked at. Yeah. And then a lot of the times you'd expect you don't have super crystal clear fact patterns. You know, there's a little consulting going on. There's maybe it touches on one of the one of the professional services fields. It's in the medical field or it's, you know, performing arts related. And it, it's a little bit of a blended business and you're not sure. I mean, oftentimes we will get, you know, calls from CPAs that want analysis of, of you know, some of those more nuanced questions. So that is uh, something we've seen. And if you're out in front of it, you can, you know, potentially carve out the non-qualifying piece if it's like clear that you have two separate businesses going on or do certain things in your marketing materials or, or other documentation to bolster the argument. Um, but we do get that question a lot from, from, you know, clients and CPAs of, Hey, is, you know, what do you think about this business? This is what it does. Um, so. uh, yeah, kind of, kind of moving away. Just a, a few kind of key takeaways here, um, a, a, just to keep in mind. Um, you know, one as as Mike mentioned earlier, if you do have, if you do buy C corp stock in some of these these kind of emerging companies, kind of, you know, however you may have gotten into it, uh, it is something to consider if you weren't already aware of this or thinking about it that maybe you have a potential to qualify for qualify small business stock in this 1202 uh, tax benefit. Um, similarly, things to someone who, if, if you are, uh, you know, have a fund that invests in these type of companies, obviously this is something that, that you can, uh, that, that can potentially apply again for, for, for purposes of the, of the QSBS rules. Um, if a partnership or an entity taxes, a partnership purchases, uh, qualified small business stock, they, they are able to pass through uh, the benefit of that uh, to their partners. Um, there's, there's some, there, there's some uh, requirements on how, how exactly that works um, in, in that effectively, in order for a partner to receive that benefit, they generally need to be a partner at the time that the, that the, the partnership, you know, the fund or whatever acquired the qualified small business stock, and it's only going to apply with respect to their interest uh, that they held as of that time and that they continued to hold until the date that the that the the partnership actually sold the the small the qualified small business stock. Um, so there is an ability for that to kind of look through. And one of the one of the questions that seems to have been a popular one for this that's kind of come in was asking about how that can apply to carried interests. Um, and I think it, it, it's not a hundred percent clear with uh, how things, how the rules are out there. I, I guess you could say there's nothing that explicitly says that. Um, like I said, the way that the statute uh, speaks to kind of the look through on a partnership is looking through with respect to the interest that you hold at the time that the partnership uh, acquires the qualified small business stock. So certainly if you were going to have a carried interest, you need to have that carried interest uh, at the time the, the time the stock was purchased. And it also deals with the interest that you have that is attributable or, or, or the gain that is attributable to the interest you have at that time. So obviously anything that, that is issued later on, um, you know, wouldn't apply for that. But it would seem that if you had a carried interest or something that did allow you to participate after hurdles were met or whatever, um, that potentially that could apply. Um, this is probably true regarding whether there's any kind of vesting or other other procedures there. The the IRS um, uh, revenue procedures on this uh, 9327 and 2143 generally treat you as a partner from day one uh, with respect to that stuff. 
um, you know, with respect to a carried interest. So I think there's a, an argument that, that, that that's how that should be looked at. It, it, it's, and I say it's not clear because, again, none of those kind of terms that are used for what you're interested in are really spelled out in the statute or regulations under 1202. And there is in the 1045 context, there is um, uh, kind of a similar, when you're dealing with some of these rollovers, if you did a 1045 rollover, uh, if it is with respect to a partnership for purposes of determining the eligible gain in that, that can kind of be rolled in that circumstance, um, the regs over there apply basically a partner's smallest capital interest they've had at any time. Um, so if you had a similar application to carried interest in the 1202 context, then, then you would not be eligible for this benefit. Um, those, those regs do not apply to 1202. Um, but obviously are in, you know, are out there and something to think about given that 1045 and 1202 are, are kind of dealing with, uh, you know, with, with very, uh, with very similar topics. I would note on this uh, point, Chris and I were talking about, uh, that there's probably familiar with, uh, the, the legislation or just aware that there has been legislation, um, to turn off carried interest for fund managers. That, that hasn't to date hasn't gone anywhere. But within that draft legislation is a provision which would also turn off 1202 for uh, for fund managers uh, that own interest in investment services, partnership interests that aren't capital interests. And so sort of by implication, it's acknowledging that, you know, under the current rules, if you are a fund manager, your fund invests in businesses, um, you know, that, that are qualified small businesses and you take back stock interest in those companies and you hold it for five years and you have a big gain and you distribute that gain, you know, to, you know, uh, return a capital hurdle to your investors. And then, you know, an 80, 20 split 20 to the, to the GP that that 20 of gain going to the GP, you know, if it's QSBS, gain at the bottom that it should flow through accordingly. That's the whole concept of carry is that it is a bona fide um, partnership interest in the fund. And therefore it gets a K-1, it doesn't get a W-2 and that on the K-1, it the character of that income flows through. So, you know, the, the rationale and the logic that, that fund managers should be eligible for QSBS uh, is there. But as Chris noted, there is a little you know, a little bit of uncertainty because it's curious in a, you know, sort of an analogous or related code section, it limits the benefit to a capital interest. And that's the 1045 rules. But, you know, those aren't the 1202 rules. And, you know, I think it could be pretty comfortable that fund managers should be, um, should be eligible. Um, on the 1045 point, there's, we're not going to get into it in great detail, but there's a, if you sell qualified small business stock before the five-year hold, um, you have an opportunity to roll it within 60 days into a new qualifying small business. As a practical matter, we don't see many clients do this because they're just not wheeling and dealing in, in angel investments and they're more careful. And, and when those companies want to raise is really not a timetable that the investor is uh, is dictating, but you know I would note that if you are a a manager of a of a you know angel fund a VC firm and you got a lot of deal flow, and you know, you have one company that exits for four or five years and you're looking to make another investment, you you know you may have a better opportunity than some individual out there to actually take advantage of that 60 day rule. So just be be mindful of that rule because it could come in handy and be a benefit to, to you as the GP and to your LPs. Okay. All right. Um, yeah, just kind of kind of flipping through a few more of these things. Um, I think we've talked about most of this. Um, yeah, one thing, one thing I did want to mention, um, and, and this, this also came in on a question, um, is just kind of, if you are an investor in one of these things, you know, what can you kind of do to document you know, your qualification for these things. Um, you know, one thing you'll often see, and we kind of have a, a sample wrap up here, is, is you may get some kind of a, of a qualified small business stock rep in your 
uh, in your offering documents that you have for make, making your investment. Um, again, I don't, and this is, this is somewhat, uh, I, I think more from, for, for accountants and people kind of after the fact to give some comfort that, you know, someone's looked at this, that this was, you know, it, 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 at least from their perspective, a lot of these requirements that are the more kind of objective ones um, have been met. Uh, and so you can kind of help with your, if with your return preparation, sometimes you might also want to try to include um, maybe some language that the company would also provide, you know, any, any information that you reasonably requested in, in helping you maybe, uh, you know, determine whether you, whether a sale of your stock at some point in the future would qualify uh, you know, for this, for this 1202 exclusion. All right. Oh, saves. Yeah, one, one other thing we did want to mention here quickly, just because it is something you'll see a lot in this space, uh, or these, or, or is the concept of SAFE, which are these simple uh, agreements for future equity, effectively, um, it, it, effectively some uh, you know contribution, uh, or you make a contribution to the company in exchange for an agreement to basically get a, usually a discounted uh, in, you know, investment in the next round uh, of, of funding that the company does. Um, and they, they kind of have, this is, this is kind of a form agreement. The, There's put out, the, the Y Combinator puts out kind of form agreements for these things. Um, it it's, it's somewhat depends on the exact terms of the thing. Um, there's probably some arguments that these could potentially be treated as stock. As you'll see here, the sample form that we pulled here actually has the parties agreeing to treat it as stock for these purposes. Um, I think there's probably also some very good arguments that it's more of a, uh, a prepaid forward, uh, as opposed to equity. And if that was the case, you wouldn't get holding period or anything like that until you actually convert it. But something we just wanted to touch on quickly. Do you want to jump around? Yeah, we probably you should. Know, don't you because we're this? getting, like, I want to make sure we get people's questions. And there's a lot of interest in the stacking and the packing and also spouses. I was just QSBS as blight as spouses. So we're going to, you know, be, be receptive to what people are actually interested in. And, uh, you know, if you have questions on some of these pitfalls, um, you know, look at the slides. The slides are intended to be self-explanatory uh, where you don't need someone to walk you through them. But, but you know, if, the, you know, obviously reach out to us if you have questions on that. We'll try and circle back if we have time, but let's jump ahead a little bit to the stacking and the packing. Um, and then we can also get into conversions and stuff too, if there's time, but, um, and all right. So here's the, here's the planning. Um, and I guess I, I'm going to answer one question first that came in before we, uh, you know, jump into this, but it was spouses, you know, you have a, a taxpayer, um, a husband or a wife that owns, you know, a, uh, $15 million of QSBS. Uh, the exemption, as you know, is $10 million. They file jointly. Do they each get $10 million or because they're filing jointly is the cap, you know, uh, applied on a joint basis of 10 million for each of them? Uh, the answer is it's not clear. There's articles out there talking about this. Uh, my view is that the better position or the, the more um, sort of the better argument is that it applies on a joint basis, is that the $10 million cap, uh, husband and wife can't claim together $20 million of exemption. There's, there's an argument to be made that read literally each taxpayer, each spouse is a separate taxpayer, and that even though they're filing jointly, they are still their own taxpayer and that it's $10 million per taxpayer. But if you look at, you know, there, um, there's a parenthetical, which basically says that if filing separately, that the, the limit is cut in half to $5 million. And that parenthetical that cuts it in half uh, for separately filing spouses, you know, appears in other places of the code. For example, 163H for mortgage interest, the max debt that you can have uh, that qualifies as a you know principal residence. 
or, or a mortgage interest deduction has a dollar limitation with that same parenthetical. And there's a case out there. It's called Boss. It's in the Ninth Circuit that that has dicta. It's not binding, but talked about what is the purpose of this this parenthetical, where it cuts the cuts the the uh, the dollar limit in half when you have married people filing separately, and it's uh, basically saying it's you know supporting this position that it is a that the the original dollar amount, the ten million, or in the mortgage interest case, the one million, applies on the joint basis. And that if you file separately, that it gets reduced in half. That's how a court has interpreted a statutory structure like this in a different area. Um, and I think similarly, you know, if you're filing a, I, I don't think a, a CPA out there would be comfortable taking two million dollars of mortgage interest um, for a couple that on, on a single residence. Like by just by analogy, if you're say, oh well, you have two two taxpayers, husband and wife, that own a home and they, they put, you know, acquisition debt on there of 2 million. Well, are they each a separate taxpayer? So we can write off, you know, mortgage interest deductions up to the 2 million. I, I don't think you'd see that. I haven't seen that. And so by, I think that's the, the better argument. Um, so that's just my view on that. There was a question where does the spouse who inherits QSBS get favorable treatment as an original owner would? If you inherit it, yes. So you you can, and this was a section that we skipped over, but if you receive the stock by gift, uh, by devise upon the, the uh, someone's passing, um, uh, or um, as a distribution out of a partnership, the QSBS status uh, continues. So you step into their shoes uh, with respect to holding period, with respect to QSBS eligibility. So yeah, if the spouse dies and leaves the shares, um, you know, to a spouse that, that it would, um, that, that should continue. Um, so just want to make sure we cover that. So, and then we'll get into the, the planning stuff. Okay. So Chris, you want to do? It's Jill. Oh, okay. All right. So one of the common planning techniques when you have QSBS that is above the, the $10 million threshold as built in gain of more than 10 million. And in most cases, this is going to be a founder who's really hit a home run. Rarely does a single angel investor, um, you know, have you know, hit this much of a, of a home run, although it's possible. One of the common planning techniques is to use gifting because again, it is a each taxpayer. There's ambiguity of whether spouses on a jointly filed return or separate taxpayers but uh, children, trusts, non-grantor trusts that file their own tax returns, there isn't that ambiguity. Um, so the, I'll get to the CLE word in a little bit, but, but so where you clearly have a, a, can establish a separate taxpayer through creating non-grantor trust, um, then you can transfer some of the shares by gift to those trusts. It could be a taxable gift. It could be a non-taxable gift, depending on how the trust is structured. There's a concept called nings and dings, which are structured in such a way where you have a, um, a completed gift from an income tax standpoint, but the grantor has retained sufficient control over, over the trust assets where it's not treated as a completed gift. For, uh, for gift tax purposes. And that's essentially getting the best of both worlds. You get it out of your, your taxable income from a federal income tax perspective. It's, it's owned by a different taxpayer for income tax purposes, um, but you haven't used up any gift tax exclusion. Um, currently each taxpayer gets $11.7 million exclusion, but if you did a taxable gift into a trust, you, you would, you know, potentially be able to stack or multiply the benefit, but you would be eating away at your lifetime ex, uh, exclusion. That's also why it is better to do this early. You know, a lot of people sort of after the fact say, oh, I have this, you know, I'm going to sell my company. I have this huge gain. What can I do? Well, uh, you know, if you don't want to go into the, you know, then, then you get into a host of different issues that Chris and I were talking about, which is, well, how much planning can you really do comfortably right before a sale? Uh, even if you can get comfortable that this, these transactions aren't going to be stepped together or viewed as not having sufficient substance, 
well, the gift tax valuation could be really high. And so, you know, yeah, you're going to maybe win on one side, but lose on the other side. So again, it is better to think about this planning early when you have lower valuations, when you're not immediately looking down the barrel of a sale and you have the risk of, you know, looking like you're only doing things in anticipation of a sale and therefore you're risking, you know, a substance argument. But, but yeah, if you, I mean, we've talked to different practitioners in this area and there's, you know, no sort of one size fits all as to how many trusts can I create? I think some might say, you know, three non-grantor trusts, others might say one per, uh, one per child. Again, it's, it's facts and circumstances uh, because each trust has to have a purpose. Uh, so, but, but that is the general concept here is you're, you're multiplying it by, by creating or identifying different income taxpayers and gifting shares either as a taxable gift or a non-taxable gift if you do the ning or ding strategy uh, so that each of those taxpayers gets the, 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 the benefit of the, the greater of $10 million or 10x basis. Yeah. Um, yeah and, and again, like Mike's saying, this really is uh, is kind of a facts and circumstances. The the IRS comes in and attacks these. There's there's a provision in the trust rules under 643F um, that lets them just you know kind of ignore a trust if, if it's really just being used for for tax avoidance purposes. So again, the sooner you do this type of planning, um, obviously the better. If you're not if you're not going to be selling right away. Um, you know, that's certainly ideal if, if, you know, if you move it to trust and they stay there for a few years, that's obviously great. Once you, um, you know, once you do, uh, move to, um, you know, once you're kind of past that and you're near a sale, that's where it gets a little trickier and how much can you do and how much risk, uh, do you want to take? Um, so one, um, one thing I do want to pause real quick. We're a little late with doing this. We should have oh, told the you guys CLE this code CLE. Word. Is yeah. a business 2022 for those of you who need CLE credit and apologies for <laughs> pushing it to the end. Um, Packing. The, yeah. the, the other thing we want to we want to. Oh, oh, there's sure. a slide on the Ning or Ding strategy. It goes into it a little bit more if that is you know relevant to you or or your clients and and you have questions about that. But a basic overview of well, okay, I, you know that that you know non non taxable gift. Um, so is very appealing, you know, wh what is, what do I have to do? What would that look like? And this is sort of very broad overview of that planning that, that, you know, a uh, qualified T&E lawyer can help you with and which we have here, certainly. All right. And then, so packing, this is another, another kind of planning that can, that can potentially be done. Uh, with respect to uh, you know sales of sales of um, of QSBS and and kind of taking advantage of your of your maximum per issue or limitation um, and and really where this really where this can play off of is is you get kind of a ten million dollar aggregate amount uh, kind of for the lifetime with respect to a corporation or you get each year you can take ten times the aggregate adjusted basis of the qualified small business stock. That you disposed of during that that particular year, the the key being here, you know, I think kind of two takeaways. Um, one, the ten million and the ten times are not mutually exclusive. You can use your ten million first, and then you can still use that ten times later on for sales in subsequent years. So you do have an ability to kind of use both of those, even without you know just kind of timing when your sales are. Uh, additionally, for the ten times basis rule. The requirement doesn't necessarily require you to sell um, shares that are QSBS stock that you've held for five years. Um, it just talks about uh, you know qualified small business stock that you've sold. So if you have qualifying stock that's everything but the holding period and you have high basis in something like that, and you can kind of combine a sale of that with the sale of other you know shares that you do have that do qualify for the for the five years such that you're able to such that you're able to kind of increase what what you're allowed here we have we have kind of a simple a simple example here um i think tim owns 20 percent of a startup valued at 100 million dollars 
Uh, he has zero basis founder shares in here worth 20 million. Uh, you know, a year before the sale, he makes a preferred investment in the company for additional shares while the company, you know, at the time the company still a qualified small business. Again, remember the hundred million dollar value, a lot of that can be goodwill. So certainly can still qualify. Um, you know, he, he puts in, he buys some more shares a little bit before. Um, if he sells both of his shares on exit, now he has a $2 million basis in the shares that he sold. That gives him a $20 million limitation, and he's able to exclude the gain from his founder's shares. Um, you know, that that's one way that this can be done. Another way that you can sometimes see this is if you have founders or other, other uh, employees that have options um, where they can exercise options and pick up the income from that and get additional basis uh, in shares from something like that. Um, you know, again, really anytime you can increase your basis to over a million dollars, you have the, you have the, the potential to get, you know, with the 10 times requirement there, that kind of gives you, you know, every dollar above that kind of gives you 10 times more gain you can exclude. So certainly if you are getting to a spot where, where you do have low basis, you have a lot of gain in something, you know, considering some of, uh, you know, strategies like this, uh, you know, obviously this is something you'd want to do in advance um, of a sale. You, you know, we obviously can't be making, you know, putting in money, you know, uh, two weeks before we sell the company, just so we can pump our basis up, things like that, uh, you know, don't really have too much substance to them that they would be things that would be concerning. But but certainly if you know that you're on the horizon for selling something, you can look at, at ways that you can, that you may be able to juice up your, uh, you know, your, your uh, per issue or limitation here by getting some additional basis in the, in, in, in shares of stock that you may, that you can sell. And uh, on this point, it doesn't uh, have to be cash. Uh, you can contribute property. And because as Chris mentioned, you know, when you, uh, wh when you contribute property um, for 1202 purposes, you're, the, the stock that you get back for that contribution has a special 1202 basis um, equal to the fair market value. So you have some a copyright patent, an intangible asset that you could also use for the quote unquote packing strategy where it's held outside the C-Corp solution, um, but you contribute it, you get, you get an appraisal, you contribute it into the company and you take back 1202 shares for that asset contribution. And it has a 1202 basis of say 2 million. Um, because that's the fair market value of, of the asset that you put in. Well, under the per issuer limitation, you know, it's 12, you know, 10 million or 10 times the adjusted basis of the qualified small business stock. Well, this is that provision is under 1202. It refers to your 1202 basis, um, in which the, the shares that you get back for that asset contribution would be 2 million or 10 times that of 20 million. And so that is another a sort of strategy or, or, or way that, that you can, you know, um, increase your 1202 basis is preferred investments of cash, or if you have uh, valuable assets held outside of corporate solution, um, contribute them in uh, different things to, to think about. So, all right. Well, I think, uh, unfortunately, our time is up here. Obviously, we were a little optimistic with how much material we would be able to cover. Uh, in an hour. Um, we certainly, you know, some of you guys have been asking questions throughout and some of you gave us questions ahead of time. We certainly welcome any additional questions uh, that anyone has. If you guys do take a look at some of the other slides, obviously happy to, to answer any questions you have with them or talk with you about that. Um, but again, I mean, really the main purpose here is, you know, we think this is a, is a topic that that is pretty relevant. We are seeing a lot of it. Um, you know, a lot of times it's after the fact with people coming in and, and asking, you know, whether their stock qualified and, and whatnot. And so, um, you, you know, some of these issues there, some planning can be, can be very helpful in this space, because if you do do it right, this can be a very powerful, uh, you know, tax savings tool, uh, to utilize. Um, and given the state of DC, it doesn't look like the, the car pulling this back. Um, is happening anytime soon. I mean, there's still 
uh, a chance that something gets through and but but it looks like these the current lay of the land is is here to stay for a little bit longer and so you know doing planning um, in this area you know probably makes some sense because it does appear appear to be here uh, to stay uh, a bit longer. So okay, well okay. thanks everyone. Right. Thank you guys.